The thing that allows a relationship where you see someone only twice a year to, you know, like not atrophy is the vulnerability of saying, I want to see you more. As your responsibility shift, your time changes and all of that. But you can still decide that you're in a period where you're like, I really need to be making some friends right now. Like this is the carve out in the calendar. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. We are doing our special Future Of series, continues this week, and I'm really excited for today's guests, two guests, people whose work I've followed, who wrote a really cool book uh, that we'll get into in a second, which just felt really distinct and kind of genre-bending and also delightful and exuberant and real. And it's on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, which is, you know, in the category of human relations, we've got sort of like four categories, I would say. Basically, there's family. That's a big category and a very important one. There's colleagues, like people you work with. There's romantic relationships, relationships that, you know, run the spectrum of romantic love. Those can be purely physical. They can be dating. They can be lots of things in between. And then there's friendship, which is this category that exists around and in between all these other categories we have. You can have colleagues that are friends and family that are just family, but then they're family that are kind of friends, like siblings that you actually hang out with. And and I think that in some ways, you know, friendship is in some ways like one of the most important relationships we have, but also one of the least artistically represented. Um, it, it Oftentimes, I feel like dramas tend to, particularly in the canon, tend to revolve around um, families. Basically, family members or lovers are like the two like highest stakes, most dramatic kinds of relationships. Like that's where we get like Hamlet, you know, it's like, well, you killed my dad and I'm in love with you and Romeo and Juliet and those sorts of things. Um, and friendship, I think, is something that gets less represented in art, but is so important. There's a lot of research recently about how important friendship is. And I also think that it's really undergoing a lot of changes in an institution. I was just going back, you know, the Greeks were very obsessed with friendship. All the Greek philosophers were constantly talking about friendship, although their friendship was a little different because they were all kind of getting with each other, which was kind of more what their friendship was. was like very, very defined, like what their friendship was, which is this very specific form of male love and male bonding that was like, extremely exclusive and very distinct to Greek culture, but they did talk about friendship a lot and they did theorize it about a lot and they cared a lot about it. And it's an institution that is very important in my life because my friends are really important to me. I'm very lucky to have very close friends and we'll talk about that. And I also think it's changing a lot. It's changing because people's lives are changing in terms of how they're organized. There's huge macro sociological changes in terms of where people live and how close they live to, say, the place they grew up. People are moving more. There's more internal migration. There's also the way that technology changes friendships, which I think has been a huge part of the experience, particularly of the pandemic. And so I thought it was a kind of a cool idea to talk about or think about what the future of friendship would look like, particularly what we've learned about friendship in the last few years with two friends. And they are the co-authors of a book called Big Friendship, How We Keep Each Other Close. They also co-host their own podcast called Call Your Girlfriend, which is about a lot of things, but including friendship. Anne Freeman, who's a journalist and essayist, media entrepreneur, I mean, not to so, is a writer, interviewer, cultural commentator. You may have seen her and Anne profiled in various media outlets. You may have encountered their podcast or them on social media. It's great to have you guys both in the program. Thanks for having us. Hello. Hey, so let's start with friendship in the pandemic, because I feel like that's been like the big thing. We were just talking about this before I did the whole intro about how friendship has changed, how much a lifeline it's been during the pandemic, but also how it's been changed by the conditions of pandemic socializing. Like, how have you both experienced that? Let's start with you, Aminatu. Where to even start? Um, You know, I mean, as you said earlier, the pandemic has just shifted (laughs) and touched almost every single area of life. I think that um, for friendship specifically, it's interesting because... 
it is an institution generally that is not taken seriously. Yep. And I think that, you know, the pandemic was a moment that really showed that for a lot of people, right? It was like, um, who is your lifeline when we are in a once in a lifetime global like mess? And, you know, for Anne and I, two people who think a lot about friendship, you know, I, I think that it's still fair to say that like all of our relationships have been challenged in this time. And every single way that we think about this institution has also been challenged because, one, I've never been through this. And, uh, you know, two, the ambient anxiety means that you <laughs> honestly communicating, trusting ourselves, reaching out mm. um, over and over, you know, and in some ways it feels like we've been through six pandemics in this pandemic. So it really, you yes. know, I think that for some people it was really hard in the beginning and, you know, that was not the case for me. Then I got harder later on and there were just all of these waves. So I think that this is just a moment of really taking stock about, you know, like kind of who is in your village and who is in your bunker and who is in your who is in your community. And I think that, you know, as you said earlier, you know, family gets uh, top billing all the time. Romantic relationships get top billing as well. And and we're not against that. Like those relationships are incredible. Um, you know, but the truth about friendship is that it is a relationship that is incredibly malleable and also incredibly valuable. Mm. And I think at least like a real source of revolution for a lot of people if we took it seriously. Mm. Mm. Yeah, when you just said who is in your village, like there was something about, I remember the, like particularly that first, the first part of the pandemic where, you know, before we knew it, like everything shut down, it just went from, it felt like it went from zero to 60. It also felt like you were, for me at least, it felt to me like I was living through history in this strange way, like, whoa, this is not a thing that's happened before. You know, like I've covered presidential campaigns, like, well, presidential campaigns happen every four years. The US occasionally goes to war. Like that's a thing, I think, a thing that the US has done that like, all of a sudden, like, no, school's done. Everything's done. And it made me feel like a kind of elemental feeling. Like a very, like, there was some deep part of me when you say, like, your village. Like, it felt like, I felt like I was in olden times or something. <laughs> like, and the feeling of olden times felt very connected to the human need for connection. And how did you, Anne, experience that? Or how did you express that in those, in that the most sort of cocooned part of that early pandemic? I mean, it's so weird, right? Because normally the things, the moments in life that really crystallize your need for a village tend to be happening just to you at that moment. You know, I mean, there's a health crisis mm. or, you know, you become a parent or you become a caregiver of an aging relative or you move or you, whatever, whatever it might be. Anything that like kind of shakes up your world considerably and creates a need to rely on your village either, you know, quite literally for food and support and everything, or just emotionally, that's you. This pandemic was like everyone all at once, like you said. I mean, I think you said zero to 60, but for me, maybe it felt like 60 to zero or something like that. Like whatever it was, it was right, a really yeah, that's good. That's good dramatic shift in, in a short period of time. And while that meant really different things to each of us, you know, for some people, it meant like a feeling of maybe extreme isolation for people who live alone, or it meant like extreme overwhelm for people who are caregivers or any, any number of different manifestations. It did mean that friends, which for most of us are not people who we live with or work with, became this, like, I don't know, like maybe maybe it was thrown into some relief because of that. It was not so like on the menu of like, this has to get done today. I think for me, uh. I thought a lot in those early days about the practice of being in long distance friendship and community, which is something that... Aminatu and I have cultivated, you know, not necessarily by choice. I mean, we just live in different places and wanted to maintain our friendship. But those are skills that just suddenly were super applicable to what used to be very casual or easy or routine friendships in my day-to-day -day life in person. Like suddenly everyone was someone I had to make time to call or check in on. Like suddenly no one was just like, you know, bumping into me in the world. And I think about those days as being like a real shift from my in-person community becoming a more mm. like on-screen community. And all of a sudden there was a flattening of my friendships in that way. There was this institution of the Zoom or FaceTime, or there was some app that a bunch of us downloaded at one point where it was like everybody's faces of some kind of virtual face get-togethers that got instantiated, at least in my, among friends of mine. And it was strange because at one level... It felt weird and alien, but there was also some part of me was like, oh, this is actually kind of nice and, and across distances, why don't we do this more? 
the kind of barriers to entry or the barriers for how you communicate with people have gotten pretty low. And in some ways, the early days of the pandemic forced me to reckon with that and make me think about how much I was reaching out to people or creating the conditions of, you know, friend interactions. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was different for a lot of people. Like, I grew up overseas, and so ever since I was 19, Skype and, you know, like, keeping up with people over video has been a huge part of my life. It's the number one way that I keep up with my family. It's the way that I keep up with my friends from high school and, you know, like, friends from other places. I think, though, that there was, yeah, it, you know, in some instances, it was really nice to be on a on a Zoom of people that you hadn't seen in forever or, you know, that the kind of high that you get from being like, okay, we can all make cocktails today and these are our friends across the globe. But I will say that for me, that was like hard almost immediately because I'm already practiced at like, you know, like internet interacting with people and it was really exhausting. It was really, really exhausting. Mm -hmm. I remember having, um, like I was an early COVID birthday and the one thing that I had specifically asked for was no Zoom. And it was a thing that I was surprised with. And I had to put on like a really happy face. And <laughs> Wait, you had a Zoom surprise? Oh yeah, I was like, please don't Zoom. I was like, this is the lamest thing I could think of. And of course, it's what happened. And you know, like, and it was nice. It was nice to see like my friends from all totally. over the place, like, you know, like in their cars and their whatever. And at the same time, like for me, that what the technology always did was just like reinforce how far away from each other we were. And there was something about systematizing it in the way that we did that, you know, again, like depending on like what your relationship with your technology is or what your relationship with people is or, you know, like where you sit on the introvert, extrovert spectrum, that was just, it was really, really tough, you know. And I think that, that kind of my my overall takeaway from that is that Having systems for keeping in touch with people in non-pandemic times is something that we should all be practicing a lot more. Yes. And that's certainly true for me, someone who just like loves to self-isolate. And, you know, and in this moment, it's it's almost like too late to, to have a system when everything has fallen mm. apart, you know? And so when you talk about, you know, like Anne and I's friendship being long distance, in some ways, we were really lucky that we had done all of the hard work of writing our book and all of the hard work of repairing our relationship when we were not in a bad, like when we were not in a good place, because it meant that when the pandemic yeah. came, I was like, okay, all of my relationships on the brink right now, but this one feels like it's doing fine. I was like, we've worked on this one. This one is on autopilot. Let's go. <laughs> I'd also like to take this opportunity to apologize for any role I may or may not have had in the surprise Zoom <laughs> yeah. <birthday. laughs> I have one request and one request I was like, only. one request only. Thank you. Um, you know what? It was fun though. Thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, it's impossible in some ways to talk about this without technology because I do think if I were to make a pie chart of my friend interactions, the biggest part of the pie chart would probably be group text. Mm -hmm. Like just in terms of raw interaction, raw minutes, seconds spent. Was that not true before the pandemic for you? So it was probably true just as a matter of course, because like I have I have a job and I have three kids and so and a pretty crazy schedule. Like I get home at 10 every night. So like the amount of face-to-face -face social friend time is a little constrained before the pandemic. But I will say that the group text really like exploded during the pandemic and has not gone down. <laughs> and to me has been a real source of like joy and comfort. Like, I guess I, I sort of feel like, and I wonder if you feel this way too, there's something about texts, friend text and group text that feel to me very pure and very young in kind of a great way and very beautiful and loving. <laughs> and whereas most other technology does not feel that way. And I'm trying to get to the bottom of this, but I'm curious if you both feel that way about text particularly. Yes. I mean, text is where you can be your, I mean, within measure, your true self. Like I am like text, like yes. you're definitely going to get subpoenaed, like always, you know, and <laughs> The rules of the group chat are that you can't be the only person that's talking shit. Like everyone has to have right. something on someone. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you're on Twitter. Right. And then that's the problem. Right. right. I think that for a lot of people that mm -hmm. I hear this from, really, it's, you know, it's people I like and I'm very much this way that I really scaled back on my use of social media because there is a difference between talking to people that you know and people that know yes. you in a smaller setting than there is with just like 
vocalizing every single thought you have for the world to hear, you know, that I think definitely plays like a part of that. Well, and there is something about the text that's like low touch, low stakes. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. it doesn't, it's, it's very different than the like, let's catch up on the last six weeks of your life or six months of your life, which can feel so daunting to try to summarize what's been going on for you emotionally. This month on Anne, please tell us. (laughs) (laughs) Last season (laughs) on Aminatu. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and the text is much more like, saw this thing and thought of you, or like, here's a joke, or can you believe this is what my neighbor has in their yard right now, which is a text I feel like I send all the time because I'm just out walking around. <laughs> um, so that that is something I relate to. And I will also offer that the spontaneous phone call has really come into my life in a big mm. way post Zoom fatigue. And that's great because the feeling of like, how are we going to schedule this around all of our lives and what's going on? I mean, I have increasingly just taken to calling someone who I want to talk to. And if they don't pick up, it's fine. And it is, I I know that that provokes a lot of anxiety in a lot of people, particularly those who are not elder millennials like me, but it has been a real joy for me. Yeah. Millennials don't answer the phone or like ring doorbells. So it's like fully anxiety provoking. (laughs) But, you know, it's interesting like hearing both of you say this because- You know, on one hand, it's like, yes, we have all this technology to keep in touch. But at the same time, like, so much of this is a source of anxiety still. Because, like, one of the things, Mm -hmm. um, the reason that I have taken to the phone call is because I've reached, like, you know, the point of text messaging where it's hard to have a real conversation with someone on text. You know, it's hard to, like read that nuance or not. I'm the queen of the voice memo. So like, I will drop you a voice the note. The voice memo. I drop a voice note all the time. The voice memo, I feel like the voice memo also, and I know like I'm deducing this from like a small category set, but I do feel like overseas, it's a bigger yeah. thing. Like I know overseas friends are all about the voice memo and it's like- it's- Yeah, reading and writing is over. Like why would you type a text <laughs> message when you can- Tell someone in your voice. But when it dropped in my, when it first started getting it from people overseas, I was like, oh, this is, an, this is a fascinating technology. <laughs> like, look at that. They're taught. And I was like, wait a second. This is just, a, this is like, this is what, A, what we used to do. And then also we used to listen to voicemail, which now I would never in a million years listen to voicemail, but a voice memo, it's like, oh, well, let's listen to you. Just talking away there. I know, but you know, I I think um, it's interesting. Like, you know, you, you have voice memos, you have whatever. Like the voice memos for me is also like very low touch, low stakes. And it's not yeah. a correspondence mm-hmm. you have to keep up. You know, I will say Anne Friedman is a Midwest diva. So she is very plugged into her local post office. And the amount of mail mm. you get from this woman <laughs> is, That's true. makes me, feel very good. Yeah, we're both big users of uh, the USPS. Thank you. But, you know, That's great. They're just, there are all these ways that you can be in touch with people. But I think that, like, fundamentally, you know, a feeling that a lot of us have felt at different times in the pandemic is this feeling of loneliness or a feeling of aloneness. And those two things are not mm-hmm. always the same thing, you know. And I, or at least, like, I will speak for myself, being really, really confronted with, like, is this all there is to life? You know, and and where and where do I fit in? You know, like where do I fit into my relationships? Where do I fit in my community? And it's been really, really hard, you know, and I think that one of the things that like social media has done, like a, a thing that I hear a lot when, you know, I hear people talking about loneliness is this everyone is everyone is watching what everyone else is doing on social media. This idea of just being like a tourist in other people's lives mm-hmm. and making these huge you know, deductions like, oh, look at that pod. Mm-hmm. They're having a great time. I'm like, no, that pod had like three COVID scares yesterday. Like, do not trust these people. Right. That pod is in disarray yeah. and drama behind the scenes. Yeah. That pod is in shambles. <laughs> like, don't even worry about it. But the thing that I think technology and social media does is that we observe and we are tourists yeah. in each other's lives as opposed to, again, like asking questions, you know, like, what is this picture really about? How does that make you feel? Yeah. Like, what's going on here? And it's interesting that, you know, all of the things that you need kind of to survive coronavirus is good communication generally is the thing that also will save our relationships is you really have to exercise a muscle of consent and asking questions and curiosity and being really precise and clear. And Mm. I find myself challenged in my relationships in the same way that I am challenged with just navigating the virus in general. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the generosity it requires too, to really accept that, look, like when you live in a household with someone or when you are agreeing to like 
pot up or whatever, there are these very explicit agreements and you kind of have to get on the same page. But for friends who you do not live with or who are not, you know, in your pod, that is a negotiation every time the opportunity presents itself to see each other. And I think like some generosity of spirit as well of like, okay, this is what you're doing. This is your safety boundary. This is mine. And that's not even getting into like the kind of politics about how people are inferring like bigger values things from how people are choosing to live in these minute ways. And so I think, I think about all that stuff as well when I think about the way my friendships have been challenged in the pandemic. We'll be right back with more of our future friendship conversation after we take this quick break. I want to talk about the cold call or not the cold call. Cold call sounds like pejorative because the, the, just the phone call, because I think there's something fascinating about the fact that we have this technology <laughs> and, you know, I don't know about you too, but I spent three hours a day on the phone when I was 12 or 13 or 14 yeah. years old. I mean, I, I would just come home and just be on the phone and it was a huge formative part of friendship. Particularly for me, I was commuting from the Bronx down to Manhattan, so it was not like I could... Yeah, you know, I didn't live around the block from people. So this was how I was constantly in touch. We didn't have cell phones. The technology has fallen into such disrepair in our in our lives, partly because the actual technology sucks. Like a landline sounds amazing. You hear your own voice through the receiver, um, which is really nice. It's intimate. It's almost like a whisper. It's like a it's like this mic as opposed to cell phone service, which sucks and always is breaking up and always sounds bad and you can't hear yourself, so you shout. But the phone call, I have been in the same place of rediscovering the phone call during the pandemic on drives of just calling a friend I haven't talked to in a while. And there's something profound and also weird about the fact that you're like, wait a second, I can just do this. <laughs> like it felt, It feels like, I can't just call Josh, can I? It's like, well, why not? You can just call people. You can just call people. I can just call Josh. Je- like, I call my Josh all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have a landline. I have a landline and I call like special people on the landline. It's like when I, oh, when I pick good. up the princess phone and I call, it's like, this is... <laughs> This is for special people only. Yeah, you know, it's like you're saying that you're rediscovering the phone call. Like, I love picking up the phone to call people. And I also love FaceTiming. And I think some of these things are also just generational because I love to FaceTime people anytime. If you FaceTime me, no matter where I'm at, I will answer it. And most people cannot handle that. They're just like, I have to be ready. I have to be whatever. And I was like, no. No, I love the grocery store FaceTime or the like the running errands FaceTime with the phone sort of down and like the light go. I love, I actually love that. I know, but I love the, the pandemic. of that. I love the pandemic FaceTimes with pals because I got to see where everyone was, you know? It was just, there was yeah. something really special about that. Like, take me on your walk, take me on your whatever. But the thing that I have rediscovered in the pandemic, like a form of communication that had completely died for me was the long email the emailing a friend where you're just like, okay, here is the 20 paragraphs about um, this week on Amina. Mm. And... That has been, it's been like very restorative, but it's also not, you know, it's not for everyone. I think that one of the, one of the ways that I find myself really challenged is that, you know, the blessing and the problem of modern life is that we just know too many people. Like our Mm -hmm. parents' generation, like there's a reason that like, you know, you would like look at these wedding parties and there's like three bridesmaids and three groomsmen. It's like, these are the people who are the most important to you. I was like, people can't do that today. You can't, yeah. um, you know, it's like if I had to make a mental list of like number ones, there is not a stage big enough to like hold all of us. Or I think like we don't quantify relationships the same way. And so just by virtue of like, you know, for me, like having lived overseas, but also if you've gone to college, not in the town that you grew up in, if you have moved for a job, if you have moved for a partner, if you, you know, if you've had any kind of mobility in your life, um, basically if you're not living in the olden times, you, um, you know, modern people know way more people than not modern people knew. And this also really blurs the lines on, you know, like what kinds of friends are we? Like, who is a friend? Yes. You know, and how do we negotiate that? Because, you know, some people think that they are closer to you than you think you are to them and vice versa. That happens all the time, <laughs> you know? But yeah, so when I think about like the strain of technology, for me, that strain is very much tied to the how many people do you know? And, you know, having to just yeah. make that mental list of like, you're checking up on everyone. It's like, I remember my um, 
my mom and her friends, they always had a phone tree. It's how they would like give each other, you know, like any kind of like crisis, like bad news or good news. Yep. I was like, we need to bring the phone tree back because it would be so much easier to keep everyone in touch if you're like, you are the touch point for these other people. But doesn't that happen tacitly to you? Like if if something, particularly when it's like big bad news, like doesn't that yeah. happen where like a friend is like, hey, will you get in touch with these other six people? We know I can't handle it right now. It does, but there's something so beautiful about the phone tree where it's that was the whole point it's like <laughs> like the explicit yeah it was it's so explicit <laughs> i love the phone tree yes the phone tree was explicit <laughs> it was like hi there's a riot tell everyone or there's we need brownies <laughs> for the school we like whatever i like there's just something about that that i really appreciate but again they you know like we know too many people and that is um makes it hard yeah at that point the sort of large sociological forces i was talking about in the beginning right there's all these things that are different you know, than 20, 40, 60 years ago, right? So it's still the case that most people live within a, I think it's like a 20 mile radius of where they were born. Wild. That's still the case in the US. That number has declined over time, although it's still very high. I actually am one of those people. I live uh, within a 20 mile radius of where I was born in good old New York City. But the strains on this, right? The sort of, when you think about an earlier generation of people being geographically close to each other and then embedded in these institutions, whether it's like the PTA or whatever it is that kind of the relationships revolve around, I think of it the way I've had, like I had summer friends in, in, when I was growing up who were like just the kids who were around. And like, and sometimes they were close, sometimes they were not, but it was just like, they're just the people around. I feel like a lot of adult friendships for a lot of people in a lot of times have just been that, right? It's your kids are in the same class or you're live on the same block or you go to the same church. These produce these friendships because the people are there, right? But the nature of modern levels of mobility, like just moving around a lot and knowing a lot of people and going away to college and then maybe going somewhere for a job and and now you're in LA and I mean, not to you're in Park Slope, like that, that, yeah, creates different rituals for how to have friendships. And that's only going to get more, more intense and more sort of scattered the further that that trend continues. It's true. But, you know, those friendships that you mentioned that are like, oh, like we sit next to each other on the bleachers while our kids play sports and we yep. go to the same church, you know, like like some of the experts we interviewed for the book were like, yeah, we study what it takes to turn those friendships into real friendships, like the kind of circumstantial. And, you know, they don't always make the leap. They don't always make the right. transition. And I think like, you know, what's really interesting about this moment after those connections were gone and in some cases are still gone from everyday life. It's like, you know, oh wait, was that person actually someone I was deeply connected hmm. to? Like, do do I need to reconnect with them even though the circumstances are no longer there that keep us in touch? I mean, I really asked myself a lot of questions about the role that those kinds of people play in my own like happiness as like um, an admitted extrovert. You know, like how much do I need the people who are not on my number ones, you know? Wait, so I have found one of the things that I didn't realize I missed, but then I realized I missed when it came back were like very casual friendships. Like very, very, like oh. that level of, like for me, pick up basketball like, I love playing pickup basketball, and I know the people that I play pickup basketball with. I know their names. I kind of know what they do. I might know where they live. Maybe. We have a very effortless, nice vibe. We're not, like, super tight friends. I'm not going to tell them if I'm mourning someone or some huge event life happened. It's completely casual. And I actually, that category of relationship, even chatting at someone in a bar, like, talking to someone, you know, the next table over, whatever— I like those kinds of relationships and those entirely disappeared during the pandemic. And that's different than like friendship, friendship. But I actually found that middle space of casual, like low stakes relationships really nice to come back to once things started opening up more. Yeah, and those relationships- The text message of friendship. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but those relationships also take the pressure away, you know, from the like, everything has to be serious and intense. I, yeah, it's like, I admit like, Every single time I met a new person in the pandemic, I did make a lot of friends in the pandemic, actually. And I was like, and every time I was like, this is, this is like heroin. I love it. Like, <laughs> I cannot, yes. I can't, you know, like. Seriously, small talk. You're just like, yeah, hey, what are you up to? Blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. Like, like a per yeah, a person would like bring their friend and you're like, if I talk to one more person I've been potted up with, like I'm going to explode and you just hear a new voice or whatever. I had this magical night in New York in June where I ran into a friend on Soho. Well, not even a friend, an acquaintance. Intense then, like now we're friends. Someone who like we know each other's first names, 
never knew last names. And we're like, whoa, the last time I saw you was like when we were talking about whether COVID was real. And I went on a walk with this person and every single block, we like ran into someone that one of us knew. And it was just like the loveliest, like at the end of the night, I cried. I was so happy. I was like, hi, what's your last name? I never actually yes. connected with this person. But yeah, you know, as I think there is something about having these like casual bonds that are really good for us, you know, and and so much of what we write about in the book too is that, you know, part of the, the thing that is really special about friendship, this is true about every relationship, but in friendship specifically, it happens in its own way that, you know, friends hold a mirror to you. And, you know, mm-hmm. our our mutual friend, Daya Olapade, correctly ascertained that, like, you know, we have sonar for each other. And I think that that's true even for these, like, very low stakes friendships that you have. It really tells you about who you are in the world. Like, how, you know, you just get to tell a different story about yourself. You get to try mm-hmm. on, you know, like a less fraught personality if you want mm-hmm. and and just, like, live a little bit. And so... Again, you know, like, it's also funny talking about this because when you think about, um, you know, I, I've read every single think piece about marriage in the pandemic. Like, it's it's hard, it's good, it's whatever. One of the things that's true is, well, guess what's the thing that takes a lot of pressure off of your marriage being your everything? Having friends that yes. you can, like, take that energy to. <laughs> right, because we're all, we all have different facets of ourselves and those show in different relationships. I mean, there's no one person you're going to be every person part of yourself with. Do you know how much therapy I had to pay for before I knew that? <laughs> and everyone is just, I was like, that did not come with the instruction manual. I had to spend thousands of dollars before I realized what? Well, you just you just mentioned Dio and, and your podcast called Call Your Girlfriend. And, and this comes up in big friendship too. There's like a huge gender divide too, right? In how these friendships work and also in trends. So there's all this stuff about how men have fewer and fewer friends. And there has been this weird sociological development of more and more people saying they don't have a single friend um, when they answer surveys as American life gets kind of more, I don't know, lonely and alienated. I guess I wonder what you, uh, you guys talk about this a bit in the book, but what you think is driving that and whether, I wonder if the pandemic reverses that trend, actually. I mean, that's, that's sort of one of the things I've been thinking about. Like, what comes out of this different and what doesn't? And one of the things I think might come out of it is the way we conceive of social relations and friendship. Mm-hmm. I mean, we do take pains to note that both of us have big, close friendships with men. Like, that's definitely true. And I think sometimes this conversation gets a little muddled in questions of, like, you know— potential like oh like you know the the reductive interpretation is like oh men just aren't suited to this kind of like you know platonic intimate bonding which is really funny given everything you said about like the greeks earlier yes yes um Cis-hat men. but but there is I, <laughs> <laughs> always in shambles Air always quotes, in shambles <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, I I do think there's a couple of things going on. It's like, it takes work. And like, you know, it is true that people who are socialized as women are generally socialized to put more emphasis on and effort into emotional connections and relationships. Like, I think that, again, that is not anything about capacity or desire. It's just like, you know, what is normalized. And so, you know, I do think that some of those statistics about like, you know, people without a single friend or, I mean, men whose wives are their, the only person they talk to about their feelings ever. Like those kinds of things make me profoundly sad. And I think that's one reason why we really took pains while we say, look, like we're describing a friendship between two people who were socialized as women, two people who identify as women. We really don't want to say this is a book about women's friendships or this is a phenomenon about women's friendships because like do not want to limit the sense of possibility that I think is like equally present for you know all of the men I know certainly yeah I mean this is this is front of mind for me because I just came back from a weekend with some of my best male friends who I've been friends with since high school since 12 basically and some of them went to elementary school together so they've been friends they were four. We love to see it. Five. Love to see it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I mean, it's crazy. Like some of them could remember meeting the other one building blocks like in pre-K. I mean, that's I mean, that's the level. I mean, I really prioritize these friendships and that we all do. I think collectively they're really important to us. And I do think that people who are raised as men are not <laughs> trained and raised to see that as important. And they're not trained and raised also, I think, to do the like, 
you know, the emotional stuff. I mean, there's a lot of like razzing and jokes and dumb, you know, all the stuff that comes with like a certain kind of like very overdetermined, like trained male bonding, you know, like a, a normalized thing. But then there's also like, hey, this is where like, this is my sick family member. This is like my kid has been struggling. Mm-hmm. That stuff is like the deep stuff. And that's honestly, it's harder. I mean, I think people, depending on how they're conditioned and trained, like conditioned and trained as men, particularly cis pet men, are not great at that. <laughs> not, and not that's not like a generalization, like some are, but that toolkit of like, hey, this is where I'm at in these deeper emotional stuff, like is harder, but it's also like super rewarding, you know? And that balance that you get in friends between like laughing at goofy stuff and also being able to talk about the deep stuff, that really is a special, unique thing that comes out of that relationship that isn't really replicated in the same way in any other kind of relationship. And if it's not there, to me, it's a phantom limb kind of thing. Like there's a thing that is not getting, not happening, you know? Yeah, you know what kind of is frustrating to me about sometimes the way that this gendered conversation works out is that I am someone who is like a self-proclaimed emotional idiot. So when when I hear, you know, like when I hear that, um, it's true that I was socialized to do more of this emotional work. It doesn't mean that it's right. easy or that I know how to do it or right. that right. just because uh, women talk about their feelings that it's a successful, productive conversation either. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> Anne, am I, am I letting on too much. <laughs> I, I'm just laughing. Like all, all kinds of toxic, like intra female friendship yeah. conversations. Like, yeah, it's not always good or perfect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not always good. I was like, mm, I was like, some of you, some of you should share less of your feelings actually. And like, yes, edit. exactly. <laughs> Fewer feelings. Let me say as a, as a, as a, as a straight, uh, <laughs> cis white man raised in the Irish Catholic tradition. I actually think a certain amount of repression, a certain amount of stuffing it down is actually pretty good sometimes. 100%, 100%. Can go a really long way. <laughs> like, that, that's, it's, you know, you don't want too much of it, but also you don't want a total absence of it. Walking that repression line. 100 P, not me agreeing with the white man, <laughs> not me agreeing with the white man, but it is true. But like, he, just push it down. But here's the other thing, right, is that I do find that like when, because um, I know a lot of men actually, um, who, both American and not American, who have like really deep friendships with their male friends. And there are just so few avenues to celebrate that. You know, I think that Mm. because women's friendships are so infantilized, we have ways to kind of like signal to the world that, you know, like here is my crew, here is my squad, my whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, that is very visible and very seen. But, you know, when I think about like what I want the future of friendship to be, I was like, I would like for us to find ways to like really celebrate different kinds of friendships. Like Anne and I celebrate our friend anniversary. It's, you know, I was like, we are putting the time in here. Like this is, this is worth it. We go on vacations, we take pictures, like all of the, you know, like everything that your family try to make you do that you hated is like, it turns out building rituals important and building memories is important. They were on to something. They were totally on to something. But I think that, you know, a place where, um, not me sympathizing with the men again, but a place where, uh, you know, I think a place where it is really hard for men is that there are just so few avenues where we allow for men to have these you know, like really just like intense bonds and to celebrate them because, you know, and then when I think about the thing that you said about more and more people are saying that they have no friends at all, I find that also baffling because, you know, I like for me, I was like, I guess like the answer to that question is, do you feel like you have no friends or do you really have no friends? You know, and again, it's like, loneliness really is just a gap between the distance that you're feeling in your relationships. People are not just alone. So so much has been made about this like pandemic of loneliness. And it's certainly true. Like people feel a sense of aloneness and loneliness. The numbers like really do not bear out that millions of Americans are walking around without like one person who would like check in on them if they needed to. I mean, one thing that comes to mind for me is like there is no friendship, certainly no meaningful relationship without vulnerability. And I think about that trait. I mean, it's not easy for people socialized as women to be vulnerable either. But True. I think when you look at like the the sort of cocktail of messages that are delivered to people who are raised as men, you know, vulnerability is not exactly prized. And, you know, I think that feeling of um, I want the reward of a close friendship. And now I'm talking about people of all genders, but I am 
too scared to be vulnerable or I don't want to take the risk or I don't want to put in the time or I don't want to actively work that empathy muscle. It's like, well, then you don't get the reward. Like, I'm sorry, but like, you know, there's a real work aspect of this that I think we have thought and written a lot about that is like, you know, not for any gender, the sexy celebrated part of it. Yeah. One of the things I took away from your book, which I really loved, was that the aspect of time, like putting in the time with <laughs> That And that is, I think, a thing that happens, and I don't think this is necessarily unique or distinct to this moment, although there are, again, a lot of big macro factors in terms of how long people are commuting or how long they work, the amount of family they have around them or don't have around them that contribute to this. But you have to prioritize it, and the more attenuated people's social circles get, the more time it takes to do. So if someone lives next to you because you're from the same town and then you bought houses on the same block because that was the natural flow of things, there's just less time to put in than, oh, I'm going to make sure I see you twice a year, we're on different coasts, or I'm going to, we're going to go on vacation together. And things atrophy in the absence of that work. I mean, that's really part of the lesson here too. I would submit to you though that, you know, it's true. We all only have 24 Beyonce hours in the day. Everyone has their like responsibilities or whatever. But the thing that allows a relationship where you see someone only twice a year to, you know, like not atrophy is the vulnerability of saying, I want to see you more. Yes. You know, like it's, it is like stating intentions in all kinds of relationships is really important. And it's, you know, usually people will relegate that a lot to romantic relationships, but friendships are the same way. You do have to state your intentions. You have to check in. You have to show a degree of just you know, like a degree of like desire. It's it's true. It's like we can't, mm-hmm. um, you can't like reshuffle the the calendar all the time. But I think that, you know, the way that the friendship doesn't get cold is when they know that you are thinking about them and that, you know, and that, I think it's the thing that I appreciate about this relationship so much is that in friendship, there is a kind of grace that does not exist in, you know, like you can't tell your parents, like, I'm going to see you in a year. Like I, like a lot <laughs> no, is going on. I just had a baby. You're like, mom and dad, we just had a baby. You can't come over for a year. Like you it's can't. It's just too crazy. No, it's too they crazy will literally right now. like jail. Like they will, they will call the FBI on you and it's over. You can't really like tell your spouse, like, mm, I need like, you know, like works a little crazy. Yeah. So I'm going to check out for six months, but I'll be, I'll be back right. in here. That is a conversation that you can have with friends. And you yeah. can do that because there is a lot of grace and there is a lot of flexibility there, you know, but it's it's hard. It's hard. Everything is hard. Well, and the other thing, you know, and when you talk about building rituals, right, the things that your family wanted you to do, another thing that I have discovered, I think Kate and I both feel this way, is that like there is a quality over quantity aspect too where If you spend, like, we're very lucky we have a place upstate, and sometimes people will come up there, and that, you know, it's maybe we're together for 18 hours or 24 or whatever it is, but the depth of that time, like, like swaths of uninterrupted time with a person, you know, up at one in the morning by the fireplace, like, getting deep or whatever, is so incredible and adds up to so much even if it doesn't happen that often. That deep time together, like, uninterrupted time in each other's presence really adds up to a lot if you can make the time for it, for tending those relationships and having them feel present and real in, you know, today's hectic world, (laughs) as it were. Well, and that's how and where you get to a place of actual openness and honesty about what's going on with you. Because like, you know, it is absolutely crucial to kind of like make the time and state the intention. But then if you're not really showing up with your full self or you're not bringing that vulnerability, then it's like, it's never going to feel satisfying or like a real connection. They're really, and, and I think like, this is hard won lessons through many expensive hours of therapy with the two of us. It's like, it can feel like you're showing up, but if you are not actually talking about like the real stuff of your life at some point, there is going to be distance there. Mm-hmm. And I think like that, that point about going away together and that deep time is that's what that really facilitates. That's just like glue for a long-term friendship. Right. It's like, you have to figure out a way to build intimacy, right? Like, and you do that in the way that, that works for the two people in the relationship. But it's tough if only one person is being vulnerable. It's tough if, you know, yeah. no, everyone is only talking about superficial things. It's tough if you don't see mm-hmm. each other 
like struggle and be stretched and, you know, like feel a sense of generosity again. It's really, really hard. But at the same time, I just think so much about how or as maligned as friendship is. When I think about the things that are that have been hard in the pandemic, like I um, I was lucky to spend a lot of my pandemic with um, uh, a family that I love very much and being around children, like sa- like that was the mental health savior of my yeah. life. Shout out to the eight-year-old who said, what did you do during COVID-15? And I was like, buddy, this is my first COVID, but I hear you. The comedy is about to be nonstop. Um, you know, but it's like, when I think about just like the ways that the pandemic has really really, really just like overtaxed to parents, you know, and especially yes. like mothers. Part of the solution to that is, you know, I was like, it is like building a group of friends. Yeah. It is having, um, you know, I was like, I think the government should like 100% give us childcare. But in the absence of that, you know, I really want a world in which like being a member of a family unit does not mean that you are all, um, you know, you're all blood related or you have like yeah. claimed to be together, you know. Um, Anne and I joke in our book that for a long time we would send, um, we used to send wedding gifts like jointly. We have had each other on like on our insurance paperwork, our 401ks, like, you know, like health benefits, like all of that stuff. And the older I get, the more furious I am that our entire tax code is geared towards like getting uh, the heterosexual people to have 1.5 child, like children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, whereas here are adults who just want to make adult decisions about how we spend our money, how we spend our time, how we show up for the people in our community. And every part of society makes that really hard. You know, like the loneliness that a lot of people feel in America is because the family unit here is in shambles. It's like, can you imagine? Like, it's a mom and dad and kids. Mm -hmm. Like, get the grandparents in there. Get your friends in there. Get some aunts and uncles in there. This is not... It is not Mm -hmm. a normal way to live life. The rest of society does not live like this, you know? And Western society gets this wrong. Yeah, though it's funny. The older I get, the more I want, like, the house filled all the Mm -hmm. time. Like, we have... I have three children, Kate and I... We also have um, an au pair who's from here from Colombia. And I like having all of us to get like, and I think of her, you know, she's 22 or whatever. It feels like a family member, like a, like a cousin or a niece or something, you know, and the, I like the fullness of the house. And we have like my, you know, we had holidays and Kate's folks and my folks were all together. I like that. I like that feeling of fullness. Like I've come to want more and more of that. You know, I think when when I was younger, maybe wanting space alone was more of my desire or wanting to carve out your own space. But I like when a bunch of people around, you know, and someone's playing with the kids and someone else is walking the dog and there's like movement and activity that feels full to me. You know, I really, I really feel what you're saying. You know, one, one thing I, I wonder about too, is people in their different age stages of life. And one thing I think about a lot is young people entering the workforce where work is both work, but also very social. I think, I feel like when you're in your twenties, there's after work drinks, you meet people that you might become really good friends with through work. There's a the kind of thrill of being in the quote unquote adult world and all of that is gone now for the last two years for all those, all people. I feel really bad for folks that are, you know, 22, 23. Feel bad for people who aren't going to those bad happy hours? Please. I mean, okay, but yes. <laughs> Don't worry. If you're listening, you're not missing you're anything. You're literally yeah. not missing anything. <laughs> I mean, I agree, but also it's like, I don't know. You're 23, you're probably sharing an apartment with three other people and you're in your room all day doing Zooms. I mean, there was, there's something about being yeah. out in the presence of other people your age that I feel, I don't know, I, that is like completely gone. I don't think office culture is some incredible thing that we have to revive or bring back. Wow, Chris Hayes, <laughs> the champion of office culture. Mm, it all comes yeah, out. I am, Cubicle advocacy. I am not pro office culture. <laughs> but I do think that aspect of it, I think a lot about. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. And I have thought a lot about like what, this pandemic would have been like for me if it had happened at other stages of my adult yeah. life. Oh, R.I.P. Like for sure. I would not be here. Oh this my was God. the best time this could have <laughs> right? happened to me. But I, <laughs> but I also want to offer that like the, the very fact that like those early 20s years or like, you know, if you do go to college, your college years are the prime or exclusive time for making really good friends is something that 
I, I, I think that narrative has to change if yes, we're all going to have really healthy mm-hmm. adult friendships. I mean, what what is happening right now as everyone is like, okay, like who do I really want to bring back into my life? Or like, who am I okay with letting go? Those are questions that happen again and again and again. I mean, there is all kinds of research that says a lot of people's friend groups turns over, like the fr- a whole friend group turns over every seven or eight years. You know, this is not something where it's like meet your friends when you're building blocks together and you keep them your whole life. Like, yeah. like that is really cool. And I love that. And, um, but also it is statistically not the norm. Yeah. And so yeah. I want a robust and like fulfilling social experience for people in their early 20s. And I also want all of us to realize that it's like, yeah, you know, I mean, like as your responsibility shift, your time changes and all of that, but you can still decide that you're in a period where you're like, I really need to be making some friends right now. Like this is the carve out in the calendar. Yeah, it's like when I think about the older people in my life who are like models of like possibility Mm. for how I want to be, like the people that I'm like, okay, I want this person's wardrobe. I want this person's personality. Like what's going on? I want this person's dinner party. This person's dinner party. Yeah, and I'm honestly like very lucky to have um, a group of friends that like spans, I would say like teenage years, well into mid 80s. And the thing that I really, really admire about my friends in their 70s and 80s, all of the the ones that I hold close is that they have new friend energy all the time. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, it's how I became friends mm-hmm. with them. Yeah. And there's something about that that I just like really, really deeply admire, you know, like this. They're putting out the yeah, vibe. they're putting out the vibe. It's a thrill of the chase. Like they're, <laughs> they're just. They are out in these streets. They are out in these streets. But <laughs> yes. guess what, Chris? You got to be out in these streets always. Well, that's, if you dude, want friends. I. Yeah. This is a thing that I think about a lot because I remember being in Italy my when I studied there. And there were the crews that just hung out in the plaza all day. And it was old men, and old women, yep. and they had their posse, and I loved it. And they just, they were there, they, they just chilled. They fed the pigeons, they argued politics, they talked about football, they talked about gossip, they talked about whatever. It's a thing that I, you know, I think a lot of us have complex feelings about aging, the passage of time, etc. <laughs> but a thing I have a pretty uncomplicated feeling about is when you're older, particularly if you're not working anymore. 60s and 70s particularly, there's a lot of time for friends. And that's really awesome and beautiful. And that's a part of life that I feel the same way as you. There are people that I know in their 70s and 80s who are great friends and great friends with each other and and spending a lot of time with their friends. That's a really amazing part of, of life. Total friend flirts, like everywhere you go. They're just like, (laughs) Mm -hmm. whatever. But here's the thing, right? This is how, you know, capitalism is a scam. It's like, you're supposed to work hard until you're, what what is retirement in this country? Like 60, what? Our generation is never retiring. Don't worry about it. I mean, we're never retiring. Yeah, 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 right. Trust, I um, talk to my accountant. I need to die the day after I (laughs) retire because I can't afford it. But the, the point, yeah, you know, it's like you work so hard and then it's like, oh, now you have all this free time to travel and hang out with friends. Well, guess what? If you didn't put the work in, you're yeah. like 30s, 40s, right. 50s. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, like what have you been doing for the past 40 years? Yeah. You are going to, you are going to be the yeah. senior who has no one, you know? And so right, that's yeah. the, all of the research and all of the, you know, like anecdotal data that we have, it says that like 30s to 50s really is the graveyard of um, like friendship yep. years. It's when everyone is taxed with work and family obligations, caretaking. The reasons that people are not making friends are super valid. Like all of those things are, are big. And structural. Yeah, they're structural, yep. big, important things. And at the same time, you know, it's it's really, if you're going to play the long game of, well, you know, like, what does it look like on the, you know, like, what does your golden girl scene look like? I'm like, I like yeah. I am playing for my golden girl's ending. So I, you know, like, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. By the yeah, way, like, who's in the palazzo with you? I mean. <laughs> yeah, I think about that. I mean, gosh, that'd be, by the way, Will McClanahan was 52 in the pilot for Golden Girls. You know that? Mm. I just. <laughs> just Wild. <laughs> yep. Wild. It's so wild. Wild. <laughs> wild. Wild. But really, I, I would offer to you, it's about the lifestyle, not the age number. Like when everyone cites that, I'm like, yeah, but who doesn't want to live with their three best friends at 52? Like killing it. <laughs> no, totally. But the, it also changes, it changes the vision. It's like, well, right. Like they're not, they're not like on, they're not on death's door. They just don't have their kids at home. So they're all in Florida chilling. Like 
That's pretty cool. Good for them. It explains all the sex Blanche is having. She's exactly. living her best life. Yeah. The last, last thing that drove me off of Twitter was watching a fight ensue where some kids oh, were no. saying that someone in their 30s was like middle age. And I was like, I'm out of here. Like this, this is the last, <laughs> this is the last straw. This is the last straw. Words mean things and I'm out of here. Okay. But I posit to you with average life expectancy, late 30s is, you know, pretty much middle age. That's all Which, I will say in defense of those children on Twitter. <laughs> Well, Wild. now 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 we're gonna have to remove this podcast. I know. <laughs> Goodbye. Yep. Goodbye to why is Whoops. why is this happening, Anne? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I think the key point though is that you can make friends. Honestly, this is like this sounds streakly, but it really is true that from four four years old or two years old playing with blocks to eight years old, you can meet people and you can make friends. And it's one of the great joys of life that we should celebrate and care for and tend. And something that you guys have written really beautifully about tending and caring for. Yeah. And it just teaches you so much about yourself. Like make friends for pure selfish motives. You will learn so much about yourself. I think that if a lot of us are honest also, you know, like I know you made the joke about the Greek philosophers all, um, you know, like uh, like (laughs) being more than friends. Yeah, well, they they were all very complicated. Here's the truth though. It's like, but you know what I mean? But it's also like, that's fine. It's like, if you are, um, yeah, I like the the older I get, the more I'm like, I am in love with my friends. Like that is true, Mm -hmm. you know? And like, Platonic relationships are very important. And just because we live in a world that really, um, I don't know, like elevates and celebrates romantic relationships, I think that it really like cheapens the bonds that a lot of us have with each other. Yes. You know, where um, just because yeah. just because we're not doing it together doesn't mean that we're not doing life together. And That's uh, true. You know, yeah, the it is life. We are doing it. That is <laughs> true. Yeah, we're doing life. And I think that for mo- for more people, if we were more honest, like I think that the place that we really learn how to be in love and how to be our best selves in relationships yes. is actually within our friendships. And, you know, I just, I just want people to take friendship more seriously. Well, and I would add that this is like the moment, right? Like yes, everyone's reconsidering right. it. Like this is like actually a, a rare moment of widespread opportunity to do exactly that because everybody is taking stock and looking around and thinking about what they want from their friendships. That is exactly why I wanted to talk to you guys. Ann Friedman is a journalist, essayist, and media entrepreneur in Los Angeles. Aminatu So is a writer, interviewer, cultural commentator in New York City. They co-wrote Big Friendship, How We Keep Each Other Close, co-hosted their own podcast, Call Your Girlfriend, which is great. They've been friends more than a decade, and it is great to have you both And Why Is This Happening. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Chris. Once again, my great thanks to Anne and Aminatu. Those two are, are fantastic. Their book, Big Friendship, I really recommend. And their podcast, Call Your Girlfriend, which I think is basically approaching its end or has ended by the time you listen to this, but I think maybe you can listen to the back archives. And I just love their <laughs> love their energy and their insight. And that book is a really interesting book. It's not really like any other book I've read, so I really recommend it. Our four-part with Pod Future of miniseries continues. Next in our feed, Breakthrough Energy Managing Director Jonah Goldman on the future of energy. If you're an innovator in 2022 and you're looking at climate, I mean, there is more capital available for you than you could ever have imagined in a different situation. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In team and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to NBCNews.com slash why is this happening?